Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Haven't done a vlog in a while, so I thought I'd keep you up to date on what's going on. A couple of future plans and all that sort of thing, as well as tackle a couple of topics that I don't really feel are worth making a full video about, so I'll round them up here. First things first, things seem to be going fairly well on the channel. Nothing to really complain about. We actually got through January without going bankrupt and falling flat on our faces. That's always nice. January is not a good month for advertising revenue, if you didn't already know that. It's because nobody buys ads in January. Everyone's spent out from Christmas, so there's no point in really throwing ads out to people that can't afford to buy your product in the first place. So it's never a good month. A lot of people switch to streaming or they take some brand deals. I mean, we actually got through the month pretty well thanks to YouTube Red, as it turns out. For those wondering whether or not YouTube Red is a good thing, YouTube Red is a very good thing. At least it is for me anyway. And it makes sense considering that YouTube Red pays out on the basis of minutes watched and we have some of the highest average view durations on the entirety of YouTube. We have some very long content here on the channel and we have people that do stick around and will often listen in the background while they're doing work or cooking or whatever. You know, our videos are really designed in such a way that you don't necessarily have to pay attention to what's going on on the screen. It's more of a podcast format than anything else and it seems to work pretty well so youtube red has been paying out pretty awesome dividends for us as a direct result and the income only seems to be going up at this point needless to say i'm pretty happy about that some people were somewhat concerned about youtube red i have to admit that i was not considering that it was pretty obviously going to outpay what your average ad revenue would be per person which is almost zero it's not really hard to beat almost nothing at all. You know, an individual is not worth that much in terms of ad revenue. In more cases than not, they're not even worth a cent. So you've got to bear that in mind. Obviously, paying $10 to YouTube and then splitting some of that amongst the people that you watch is certainly going to help. And at this point, YouTube Red actually makes up about 15% of our income, which is significant, I have to say. That's a nice little boost and it only seems to be going up. So I'm pretty happy with that. So there's the answer to the question as to whether or not... YouTube Red is helping creators, yes, to a greater or lesser extent, but it's helping pretty much everybody, so I'm certainly happy with how that's going. It is unfortunately not all roses and sunshine here on YouTube. You've probably heard murmurings or indeed a lot of shouting lately about the YouTube copyright system, and some people may have been wondering why I haven't chosen to comment on it yet. Well, honestly, I covered this like three years ago. I think I was one of the first to really come out and speak at length about the YouTube copyright strike system and the way that videos get suspended, the way that income is diverted away from you, and of course the potential for censorship and abuse. And I spoke on it at length in my most popular video of all time, which has got almost 5 million views. It's called This Video Is No Longer Available, The Day One Gary's Incident Incident. And I released that in 2013. My concerns haven't gone away, and YouTube hasn't really got any better at it, it's just, in my experience at any rate, silly indie game developers have decided not to poke the bear, and I haven't had any problems with any of the major publishers either, though I have been avoiding Sega and Nintendo since they are particularly egregious when it comes to copyright claims. That said though, there's been plenty of nonsense lately, you've been seeing channels going down for no reason. Channels like I Hate Everything getting suspended for pretty much no reason, channels losing privileges and monetization rights, and these are big channels as well. Team Four Star just went down quite recently for basically no reason, though it would now frankly seem to have been restored, and the current campaign appears to be a hashtag, which is WTFU, which is gonna screw with my search ranking, damn it. Yes, that's the reason I haven't talked about it. No, it, that's not gonna be a problem. Anyway, I don't really have anything to add over what I already said two and a half or so years ago. The situation sucks, it's overreach, it's covering of the arse by YouTube and Google more so than they frankly need to. These are not proper DMCA takedown requests. Yes, YouTube has to legally comply with those in the United States, they've got to take those videos down, but these are not legitimate DMCA takedown requests, as it turns out. Their internal system doesn't really count, and the problem with that is that they skirt around all of the protections that they offer to the person that is being claimed against. But here's the thing, if they're not directly abiding by the letter of the law when it comes to the DMCA, then they can also do certain things to alleviate some of the problems that these creators are having. I mean, for instance, the fact that income goes directly to the person that claimed it without any verification of whether or not they are actually owed it is insane. That income should be put in escrow and should be clearly given to the person that 
actually wins in terms of the copyright claim. Bearing in mind, a lot of these claims are reversed, but they can take up to 30 business days for that to happen, which is not an insignificant portion of time, considering that's when the majority of videos get the majority of their views. So it's possible to claim rights over a video, take the income for the first 30 days, and then even if you do win the claim against that person, you don't see any of that revenue back, which is insane. <laughs> it's unbelievably abusable. I can't imagine why you would ever want to encourage that. And we see it happen time and time and time again. It keeps happening. In fact, it seems to be happening more lately. I don't know if that's actually true or whether or not it's just a confirmation bias based on the fact that a lot of big channels have been talking about this particular issue as of late. I mean, I'm glad they finally cottoned onto it. I've been pushing this issue for years, and I'm glad that it's finally getting attention. So, you know, good on all of those big channels that are actually talking about this. Now, when it comes down to the concept of fair use, a lot of people, especially those that think they understand the law and clearly don't, will talk about the idea that fair use is an affirmative defense, and it's not, in fact, an automatic right. Well, yes, but as a concept... It is something that frankly should be respected, particularly within a system that is designed by YouTube themselves and doesn't in fact stick to the letter of the DMCA law. The fact of the matter is, it is unbelievably inefficient to have to go to court over these kind of issues, considering how frequently they happen, which is why most people don't go to court over them, obviously. It's an utterly impractical way of doing things, and frankly, I think the DMCA does need revision. There's no doubt about that. I think fair use should be more clearly defined. I think fair use should be enshrined, not only as an affirmative defense, but also as a fundamental right. And YouTube needs to step up its bloody game and actually become an arbiter of fair use. I know they've said they don't want to be, but that's a cop-out. It absolutely is. If YouTube is not willing to protect its creators, then what good is it for? YouTube was not built on the back of these large corporate channels. It was built on the back of individual creators and small groups that started off as hobbyists and became popular. As far as I'm concerned, YouTube should be instituting stricter penalties for abusing the copyright system, and they just have not done that. You know what's interesting about the DMCA is that an actual DMCA claim is subject to a charge of perjury if it's incorrect, if it's done with deliberate malice with knowledge that the DMCA claim is false. The problem is that YouTube gets around that by not actually having it be a legitimate DMCA claim, but basically abiding by the strictness of what the DMCA is anyway, at least when it comes to the claim. The claimant actually doesn't have much of the responsibility that you would see under a regular DMCA claim that's supposed to stop this abuse. A perjury charge is pretty damn serious, but you can't be charged with perjury for making a YouTube copyright claim because it's not a DMCA notice. So really, there's very little risk to abusing the copyright system, and that risk needs to be introduced if they want to cut down on the abuse. Anyway, I'm just repeating myself. You know, I said this two and a half years ago, and it's still true. YouTube has made a token effort to protect the fair use of a tiny number of creators, but it's not enough. We need to see more widespread respect for fair use, and frankly, if YouTube is going to use its own internal system, then they could also have their own internal definition of what fair use actually is. Since there are fewer requirements and a much, much lower burden of proof and duty of care when it comes to issuing a copyright claim on YouTube versus an actual DMCA claim, as far as I'm concerned, those claims should be weaker as a direct result of that fact. But hey, what do I know? All right, moving on to other things. PAX East. Well, turns out I should hopefully be healthy enough to travel and do PAX East this year, which is something that I've very much been missing being able to do over the last couple of years. As I said, the chemo is going well. My immune system is weaker than it would be otherwise, but it's strong enough to handle going to one of those events. What might happen, though, is that we avoid the signing session. I'll probably be avoiding these large, kind of very intimate crowds of people. There's a big risk of infection. There's a risk of catching a disease, a cold, or whatever, which is quite serious considering my current condition. So I may have to avoid that. But outside of that, it looks like we're going to be trying to do the podcast and I'm going to be doing a limited amount of coverage from PAX East. It's not going to be as insane as I've done before. I really can't handle that. Not at this point anyway, but I would certainly love to do some coverage nonetheless, and I will certainly cover games at PAX East in some respect. So we'll be going. I will give you more details on the plans and hopefully 
on the Co-optional podcast panel date closer to the event. Moving on to more immediate matters, it looks like this weekend I'll be working for the most part on Far Cry Primal. The embargo for that is Monday, so that will be when the WTF is should come out if everything goes to plan. Regardless of the embargo, I was able to stream the game and I did so for a couple of hours. I can't review it yet. That's what the embargo says, not me. The whole point is to make sure that all of the outlets have pretty much equal time working on it so that they can get their PC-specific reviews up. What I can tell you about it right now, based on my stream, is that the game is very demanding and it does have some performance issues, but they are not insane, at least not on my system anyway. The main problem is, of course, that it has no SLI support yet and no driver support, so it's really hard to assess the performance of this game before that support comes into play. What I will say is that the hitching and stuttering issues that were present in Far Cry 4's release do not appear to be present, which is nice. But I did find the game was very, very demanding, even on my system. At 1080p, at ultra detail, I did find it dropping below 60 in some areas. And even on low detail, it was hovering around the hundreds at 1080p, which on a system like this is a little low. You might be saying, well, that's an insanely great performance. But yes, relative to everything else it is. But based on the system that I'm running, that's lower than I would have expected. And that indicates to me that those running on lower end systems are going to have problems playing this at 1080p upwards. I was not able to play this at 1440p on a single Titan X and stay above 60. So that to me is a bit of a problem. And I think that we're going to need to see some driver support, certainly for this game. I Again, I wouldn't judge it on this basis simply because we don't have drivers for the game yet, but I will tell you on Monday whether or not that performance has remained the same. I certainly hope not, and I would hope that the drivers come out before that time. On the subject of Far Cry Primal, I would like to address something. So I got an email, in fact I got a couple of emails a couple of days ago from various games media outlets asking me to confirm my statement that Ubisoft would not be releasing review code for the PC version of Far Cry Primal. Now, I scratched my head because I never actually said that. A few days ago, Chris put out a tweet that specifically said, so far, we haven't received Far Cry Primal PC code. Now, the reason that that tweet was put out is that reviews for the game had already popped up. A lot of people hadn't realized that the PC version had been delayed a week, and they could be confused as to why we didn't have a video up when other games media websites and competitors had videos up. They also may not have known that all of those videos and reviews were based on the console version and not on the PC version. So if they were looking to buy on PC, the information that they were using may not have been accurate. So that's why we put the tweet up. It was information for our subscribers that the video would be coming later and that we hadn't received review code as of yet. It is not uncommon to not receive review code until about four to five days before release. Although it really depends. When you have a staggered launch, you often get the review code a little bit earlier for PC than you otherwise would have because it's not that the game wasn't ready, it's just that they're staggering the launch for other reasons. It's actually pretty common Ubisoft practice to stagger the PC launch later than the console version because... Actually, I really don't know why. I mean, I'd love to explain the reasons behind that. I can certainly tell you why anyone that was directly linked to Microsoft or Sony would do it, but I don't really see a great reason to do it on PC unless it's the old fear that Ubisoft has had of piracy and so on and so forth. So they want to maximize console sales and such before that happens. I honestly do not really know. I can only speculate as to why they delayed it a week. One way or the other, though, as I said, the tweet was meant to give information to the subscribers and explain why we didn't have a video. Turns out, somebody took the tweet, altered the tweet, posted it to Reddit, and it hit the front page. Now, I know this because I got sent a screenshot of said post by one of the game's media sites after I asked them, what are you talking about? I never said this. Those of you who don't know, I pretty much left social media and read it entirely, and it's made me a much happier person, and I've had a lot of fun over the past week or two with video games instead of stressing about what Reddit has said, but it seems that Reddit comes right back into focus because they decided to editorialize my tweet, and what that ended up saying was that there would be no code which I never said. So thanks Reddit for butchering what I said and misrepresenting me. And now no doubt everybody hates me and thinks I'm stupid now that there are review codes out. So I just want to clarify that and make sure that it is on record that I never actually said that. And there's clear evidence of such if you go and just read the tweet in the first place. 
Please don't change the content of my tweets. It's a dick move. The words are there for a reason. So far is a very key phrase. That's just a little bit infuriating. Just kind of wanted to get that out there. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, I just want to quickly make you aware, you've probably been watching in the background some footage of Marvel Heroes. It's actually from a failed video that I put together last night. I was doing my video on my relapse to Marvel Heroes, but... I misconfigured my audio devices, so as a result, the game audio was silent, which is not good when you're trying to represent a game. So I took the footage and repurposed it for this vlog and put some music in the background instead. I'd like to let you know, if you're planning on playing this game, that this weekend might be a good time to start, because they have a 220% experience boost weekend. Basically, up until Monday, you're going to get 220% XP, which is fantastic and great for power leveling. So if you want to get started on that game and... I have been enjoying it a great deal. It's a hell of a lot better than it was on launch, and I will be doing a full video explaining why. Well, this weekend might be a good time to kick that off. Speaking of games, I've also been playing the new Master of Orion as of yesterday. I sunk six hours into it last night, and so far, so good, actually. Uh, pretty surprising that they managed to execute it as well as they did. There are certainly some design decisions that will no doubt upset people, but... You're stuck in this really awkward situation when you're releasing a new Master of Orion game, considering the last one was awful, as to what you do when it comes to deviating from the original formula. How much do you change? How much do you keep the same? Any change is going to piss off some purists, but of course, if you just reskin the game, then what's the point in even buying it? It's an unenviable position, I have to say, but so far, I think that the game is pretty good. I've been enjoying the combat, which is actually real time now. It was in Master of Orion 3 as well, but this is much better. I mean, not only is it graphically superior, it's not those awful little blips and wireframe models, but you have more direct control over your ships. So you can actually execute some pretty cool fleet maneuvers in real time, which includes moving behind asteroids to block line of sight and actually block attacks that are coming in your general direction. You can also flank enemies in zones that don't have too many weapons pointing in that direction and all that kind of thing. And there are some special abilities that you can get for your ships, which you can use in real time, like blink and engine boost and all that sort of thing, which I like, actually. I think the combat is a lot of fun. It is worth noting that the combat really used to get bogged down heavily in the end game when you were playing Master of Orion 2 to the point where a lot of people like to auto resolve simply because there were just too many ships and you had to move them individually. I think this is a better solution. I, I actually do like this more. Yes, it's a little bit less tactical, but I still enjoy it. I think it's pretty fun. Aesthetically, I think the game is pretty good. Some people are definitely going to object to it, maybe think it's too cartoony, but I'd like to remind you that Master of Orion 2 is actually very cartoony and colorful as well. So I think that they stuck to that, but they put their own interpretation on it, and they actually did a pretty good job, in my eyes, of making that work. They've also got some really good quality voice actors in, which has helped a lot in order to bring each race to life and give them real character, which honestly was a good feature of Master of Orion 2. You have these unique races that were very memorable and all had their own different personalities. I think they've nailed that here. And there's some other changes which are nice. So a lot of nice little pieces of automation, like you build a troop transport, it'll automatically load the troops for you. If you build a civilian transport, it'll automatically load the civilians for you. You don't have to move them yourself. It'll automatically update designs when you get new technology that's relevant, if you actually want to do that. There is an addition which some people will find controversial, which is the addition of the warp lane. You have to travel to stars via a specific route as opposed to just flying to them directly. Now, this has certain advantages. It allows for the creation of choke points, and specifically at the end of each warp point, you could actually build a military base. And you can also station a fleet there. This allows you to take territory. It also allows you to ensure that incoming fleets can actually be fought before they reach the planet and start throwing bombs at you. I think the choke point system works. I hated the idea that ships could just appear out of nowhere, you didn't have defense, and you weren't able to react to that. It put a lot of emphasis on movement technology, maybe to the point of it being essential. And that's not really a choice, honestly. The game is lacking in certain areas, but it is still in early access. You know, it doesn't have governors yet, it doesn't have proper NPCs, there aren't all that many events in the game yet, and they don't have the full complement of races. But the game's definitely playable, and I actually played a nice session and enjoyed it last night quite a bit. So I will hopefully be playing a lot more of that, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that game develops. There's actually a lot of stuff on Steam I really want to play right now. Life in Bunker, I want to play this new Stardew Valley game, I think. Seems like a take on Harvest Moon of some description. There's also something called Age of Gladiators, which is a gladiatorial management game. Factorio just hit Steam. It's been in early access for quite some time on its own website. 
Certainly worth a look. There's so much. And I want to play more Super Hot as well. Jeez. It's not going to get any better either. Over the next couple of weeks, we've got all sorts of releases coming out. We're going to get hit by The Division and all sorts of other things. I still have to play Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2. I don't know where I'm going to get the time to do that. And I still want to keep playing Marvel Heroes. Ah, there are too many good video games. What a nice problem to have. And I'm actually enthusiastic to play them, which is a rare thing indeed. Let's, let's not ruin it by doing anything stupid, folks. That'd be nice. Anyway, I think that covers everything. Thank you very much for watching, and more videos will be coming your way. Just bear in mind that Wednesday is another session of chemo, so that means I will be out of action for a couple of days. Probably March the 2nd through to about March the 6th. That's, that's a fairly fair estimate. I will see you next time.